I'm joined by Professor Rajiva Vijayasinghe, who is the president of Sri Lanka's advisor on reconciliation. Many thanks for speaking with me, as Pleasure. There are recent reports of Defence Secretary Godabaya Rajapaksha's statements on war crimes on the casualties. Could this have been the first official statement coming out of the Sri Lankan government wherein he is accepted and admitted to civilian casualty? No, I think that's a very silly remark because obviously in any war one is going to have civilian casualties. Um, I'm not, of course, official as advice. I don't have an executive responsibility, but when I was head of the Peace Secretariat, I had an interview in London with The Guardian in which I estimated what I thought were the civilian casualties. The simple fact is we have said very clearly we had a policy of zero civilian casualties and that is what we stand by. But of course when you say there are civilian casualties, the next question is so you admit there were civilian casualties and though you've said something horrendous and any fool understands that in war there are civilian casualties. Our position is very clear. We had a policy of no uh, zero civilian casualties. There were civilian casualties. Some of these were caused in the course of what we call collateral damage and in particular because the LTT ruthlessly used people as human shields. For instance, I was up in Mulatibu last week talking to some of the displaced because I did a study of the hospitals that we are alleged to have shelled systematically and repeatedly. And they told us that the LTT were bringing weapons into the hospital. The chap graphically described it on tractors, he said, and they took them out. But they fired from among civilians, obviously wanting us to fire back. Now, despite those efforts to attack us using the civilians as shields, the records show, and these are ICRC records, not just ours, they are records as well, but I have them confirmed, that in the course, say, of the first uh, month where we fought very in January to the beginning of February to take the city of Putukudirepo, there were only five shells that fell into hospitals in the course of 30 days. Now, that is what I would call collateral damage. It's a better record when people are firing at you than that of any other army in the world. And these ICRC statistics. But Professor Vijay Singh, the, the video footage that we have now uh, show something in, in complete contrary, uh, in contrast to what you're actually saying right now. They have spoken of multiple attacks on hospitals and these safe zones, the so-called safe zones, uh, wherein they were not supposed to attack or shell at all. No, no, no. Very clearly, let me tell you exactly the situation. I studied the documents recently. The first set of hospitals, five of them, one of them was an official hospital, which was clearly marked, and that's the one on which there was one shell in the premises on January 13th, and then another in February. That's all. Two other hospitals very near there were then marked as hospitals by the LTT. Uh, they were conveyed to us. The ICRC did give us the coordinates. I've checked with the forces. One of them is not even damaged except for the slight end at the edge. And the people nearby told me it was not attacked at all. But they did say a couple of shells fell into the compound. Um, the third hospital uh, is damaged. That's the one on which they say uh, three shells fell in the course of 24 hours. And that's all. Nothing else. Uh, these ICRC figures. But of course, if you look at some of the reports, uh, and this is very clearly marked in the UTHR, University Teachers for Human Rights, uh, the LTT are supposed to have fired on it afterwards because they didn't want it removed. I mean, they wanted it removed, whereas we wanted the hospital to stay when the LTT retreated so that we could look after them. The second set of hospitals, which is in the no-fire zone at the end, uh, were hit, uh, but again, uh, one of them once. The other one, there's a record of one shell falling, but eyewitnesses also have claimed that it came from the LTT because it was a... They were a bit angry with the priest in charge who was sheltering people trying to avoid conscription. The third hospital was shelled, but there's no record of it being told to us. And they say that they moved it to another hospital, which is a primary school, but when I checked, there's only one primary school, which was the early hospital. So there's something fishy. I'm trying to discuss with both the ICRC and the Army the exact details of what we are given. But I can tell you now that what Channel 4 said is completely false, because the Army showed me the records that they have got from the ICRC, 
and they don't have any records for later on. Now, this doesn't mean there weren't verbal interventions, and I'm trying to check through logbooks whether there were any. But I mean, one shell in uh, six weeks is not very much. The second point, and this is particularly important, I have now the records of four or five times when the army told the ICRC the LTT is firing from us, at us from the North Fire Zone. The ICRC replied saying, well, since the LTT didn't accept the no-fire zone, it isn't a no-fire zone, and therefore it is not protected by international humanitarian law. I have the replies of the ICRC on that. Uh, but of course, that doesn't take away the responsibility of safeguarding civilians. But it makes it clear that if the LTT fires at you from there, what do you do? I mean, it's a difficult question. In some cases, the army fired back. In some cases, it didn't. But you can't say blanketly don't fire back because you're making yourself a sitting duck for heavy weaponry. Now, the other point is that on the very first day the no-fire zone was attacked and the, the UN panel plus Gordon Weiss, the spokesman, say that the UN, which was in the no-fire zone, was shelled on the 23rd and dawn on the 24th. I have a letter from the UN people saying, thank you for looking after us so well, written on the 24th. So there's massive contradiction. There's also a letter from the Bishop of Jaffna telling the, arm, uh, telling the president that he was requesting him to expand the no-fire zone, which he's not going to do if he thinks we're firing into it, and saying, I'm also going to ask the LTT to withdraw its heavy weapons from the no-fire zone and stop putting civilians in danger. This is not government. This is the Bishop of Jaffna. These are things that don't appear in the Channel 4 narrative. But there is a certain admission now that there are civilian casualties, that there have been civilian casualties, and that the Tamils have suffered during the war uh, between the government and the LTTE. Well, of course, but it's not an admission now. It is something we said at the very start. One of the reasons why we're so angry, really, is that nobody bothered to rescue the people being taken as human shields. We said this would happen. We asked them to object. None of them would. I told the UN, why aren't you doing this? And he looked at me and I said, you know, if anything like this had happened by, to us, we would attack. And he said, but you guys wouldn't. Then he stopped. And I said, what do you mean is we wouldn't kill you? You see, these people gave in to blackmail. The UN did not mention the fact publicly that the LTT was co-opting one person per family. And when I told them about it, uh, the new UN rep said, no, 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 we've said it. And I said, show me one document. He was an honest man. He went home. He called me up and said, I'm sorry, it's only in internal documents. I mean, the so-called international community behaved like cowards. I mean, there was a UNICEF head who came to me after five years of ceasefire and said, you know, um, the LTT is now going to release everyone under 17. And I said, five years after they promised it? Oh, they had problems, but they will now. And I said, 17? I thought the age was 18. And she said, yeah, they have a problem with their legislation. Then they're going to have to amend it. I said, legislation, the LTT? And then she realized what a blunder she made. She said, I'm terribly sorry. I said, Joanna, I'm going to complain about you to your boss. I did. Uh, he was a tactful man. He got her to reply. She sent me a letter. You can see the tears dripping down the page saying, I must affirm that the UN position is that you cannot recruit anyone under 18. And this woman had been going to the LTT and basically saying, yes, sir, no, sir, when they said, well, we are going to continue to recruit people who are 17. It's this mealy-mouthedness was appalling. And, of course, the Tamils suffered. They su suffered appallingly, but they suffered because the LTT treated them brutally. No one cared about them. We, in fighting back, did, I think, in engage in some collateral damage, but it was the best way of rescuing them. And the fact that we got... 280,000 out. The narratives are very clear. The LTT, which had been shooting people who came out, finally gave up because the people were clearly so anti them. The Sri Lankan government has been talking a lot about the number of Tamils that have been rescued after the war. But what about the casualties? Is there a specific number of how many people were killed as collateral damage? Because that has not really come out, even while uh, accepting and admitting that there have been casualties. Can we have a number? Well, I made an estimate two years ago to The Guardian in England. I said I thought there would be, have been about 5,000. 
Of course, we had to accept that there were LTT fighters or conscripts for the LTT who were forced into fighting who also died. But what is so irritating is there's no effort to engage in intellectual thinking on this. I'll give you one example. The ICRC took away patients from February to March on a ship. In the course of those voyages that they did, they took away 30, nearly 14,000 people. Only 4,500 of those were injured by war. Now that is in a three month period. Now if you look at the normal statistics of injured, they are three times the dead in any, in any, any war. So let's say that was more, let's say it was half. Let's say the LTT missed, didn't allow some of the injured to go because they sent another 2,000 sick people, sick, not hmm. injured by war, and another 7,000 bystanders, as they are called. And there's evidence that the Tamils thought these bystanders were not sent fairly. You know. So let's say there were double that amount. That still leaves you with a figure about three or 4,000 dead. Now, second point you need to look at. I actually, last week, when I was looking at the hospitals, I spoke to 22 people who had been in the camps, some of them returned, some of them still in the camps. Not one of them had lost a woman or a child. All, the, chil all the children were alive. One man had seven children, another had five. Three men had died. Oh, sorry, five men had died, one had fallen from a tree, another had been sick. But three men had died from shells or whatever. But I think the best comment on this is one family, there was an old woman there, she had six sons and one daughter. I met the eldest son and the daughter who's unmarried. Uh, and I asked her and she said, one of the sons died. And I said, how many? She said, well, he fought for the LTT. So I think if you extrapolate, you will realize that not that many civilians died. I mean, every single child survived. Are you telling me that if we were indiscriminately shelling, every single child would have survived? Let me give you another example. But there were, there, there, there's video footage and evidence of, of civilian casualties, including women and children. I told you there were civilian casualties. I'm talking about children and women. Yes. Yeah, but the family, I'm, I'm not saying children and women didn't die. You must listen. I said of 22 families, if all the children survived, the number would be small. I think what you have to look at is, look at the way those films were made. Some of them are clearly fraudulent. You know, you don't have a situation when people running say, why are you filming? You know, if you're being shelled, you're not going to sort of object to filming. I think you've seen the picture in which there's a crowd of girls running and next to it is a cameraman. You've seen the picture of a hospital in which there are two bodies on the floor and by the side is a trolley full of upstanding bottles. So I think there's been, I mean, I'm not saying for a moment all of it is false. Some of it is taken from our footage. But there is good every reason to suspect some of this footage. Is the government doing anything about this? Well, the government, government uh, had a problem with the Darisman report because it was not meant to be a UN report. It was meant to be an advisory report. But one very good effect of this is government decided two years too late to tell its story. And two volumes have now come out, one done by the humanitarian operation showing exactly how much food we sent. And when they accuse us of not sending food, uh, the last UN convoy to come out, we were trying to send food and get the last two people whom the LTT had kept behind, and the LTT stopped the food going in. There's much evidence of that. So that whole section of the food we sent in, the health facilities, the letters from the UN saying how we managed to avoid the epidemics, all that is there. And that is the problem, really. It's so obvious we did our best. But with regard to the so-called war crimes, the Secretary of Defense released yesterday a report, very clearly put, de detailing the humanitarian operation. Uh, but I did ask him, you know, why don't you mention the hospitals in this? And he said, well, I'm not here to answer those allegations. But I said, those have to be answered. And he said, yes, it will be done by others. I've done a lot of it. If you were to look up my blog, I have four essays on the hospitals comparing what we know from the ICRC and the UN with what Darusman and Weiss say. And when you see the internal contradictions, you'll see that it really is pretty bad. So I think we are now doing what we should have done two years ago, 
which is actually point out the positive nature of the operations that were conducted. Talking about the war crimes, it is a body that has been endorsed by the United Nations coming out with this report on war crimes, incriminating the Sri Lankan government and the forces, the army. How is the Sri Lankan government then saying that there has been no war crime? Can you say that there has been no war crime at all in Sri Lanka during the LTT? No, I can't say that at all because of this I don't know everything. But all I've pointed out is, A, this is not a UN report. It was appointed by the Secretary General to advise him. Unfortunately, the panelists thought that they were war crimes tribunal. I don't know whether you know this, but when India and several other countries helped us to defeat a motion brought by some European countries in Geneva, some of these people in this network had actually sent applications to the government saying, can we serve on the war crimes tribunal that we're going to set up? I have the letters. It came up in a scandal involved in the Canadian Human Rights Agency. A man called Archivan had written, he's a protege of these guys, you know, one of the uh, ex-Iranian, anti-Iranian government people who mm. is now a protege. He had actually asked to serve on the war crimes tribunal and asked the Canadian ambassador to nominate him. So the West was going along with this story long ago. And when I asked them, why are you doing this? They said, no, 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 we're only bringing a motion to make sure you treat the displaced well. And I said, why don't you behave like India does? India stood up for us against terrorism, but made it crystal clear that we should look after the Tamil people. And immediately after the war, India and Sri Lanka issued a joint communique saying the displaced will be resettled within eight to six months, 80% of them. And we've stuck by that by and large. Now, the other people were not interested in the Tamils because they had not bothered about them for years. You and India and Sri Lanka were deeply concerned about the Tamil people. The others were concerned with political messages, with undermining the stability of countries that managed to deal with terrorism, and they brought up this war crimes idea. Now, this report was issued by people who had started before they came by considering Sri Lanka an apartheid type which is outrageous. They actually said they thought they had to come to Sri Lanka when the Secretary General had said they didn't have to. There was pressure on to publish that report. And as I said, this is where the Sri Lanka government is in a difficult position because should we answer a report by people who ask to advise on policy but set themselves up in the tribunal? If you read the report, you'll see that a lot of things are distant. You know, they say we didn't investigate but we believe the allegations are credible. How can you say allegations are credible if you didn't investigate? But again, I'll come back to the video evidence. Not all video evidence can be fraudulent. Not all can be cooked up. There is enough evidence on, uh, on, on the net, on the website itself, of, uh, of people having been blindfolded and shot, of people having been stripped naked and beaten to death. Uh, <coughs> what do you have to say about these things? They're what? not straying elements, and if they are, then what has the government done in bringing these perpetrators Well, to what we have said very clearly is that any credible evidence will be looked at. The problem with the Channel 4 video, which is visual evidence, is that it combines two or three things. One is the general allegations about hospitals and civilians, all of which are very general, accompanied by a few photos, but no dates given, no specifications of which hospital, and as I've said, we can refute those with the ICRC material. The individual shots of people being killed or tortured I agree, need to be looked at, but the most dramatic was the Channel 4 video of two years ago, showing people blindfolded and executed, which Channel 4 said had been filmed on January 18th, 2009, which we managed to show was complete nonsense, not only because on January 18th, you know, that was not possible, but also because the metadata, which an expert examined for us, a Sri Lankan living abroad, who wrote out of the blue, so he looked at the metadata and it stated July. So then we pointed this out and I think in one way I've won some success because now Channel 4 say, oh, we've got the proper metadata. They never said this before. They showed a second video in 2010 which showed more people being killed in what purported to be the same scene. But everyone watching it realized this seemed to be chaotic because the numbers kept diminishing. You know, they shot people and there were a few bodies on the ground. And now it's been proved by the UN experts employed, the A, that this particular film Channel 4 showed was edited and edited backwards. So segment 1 comes in position 3 and segment 3 in position 1. Segment 4 is in position 4. 
Segment five, one expert says it was filmed at a different time. Another expert says it was filmed at a different place. Now, no, the point I'm trying to make is that if you're given evidence that's shaky, the people giving the evidence must say why it's shaky. I'm not for a moment saying it's completely false. But why did they say this was January? Now we find the metadata is July, but they say that happened in editing. But they also claim that this was made on a mobile telephone. So is it edited in, in July? It has an optical zoom, which doesn't occur in mobile telephones, so that's falsehood. However, there are two sections of that film, which I myself think we should investigate further. In one case, as I said, they get up and say, this happened on such and such a date, and we have metadata to show it. And I think it's incumbent on them to send us that material or the data with the details, just as I think with regard to the white flag case. And I have said this for the last two years, that also should be investigated. So, you know, those, there are two se series, but I think on both those, we asked Philip Elston to get us the data, the original films, or at least information on where it came from. I'm not talking about one network or one channel having uh, made a documentary, but in all we know that there were many video evidences that were being provided, that were being sent by Tamil groups in Sri Lanka, and it is worrisome details and video footage that we're talking about. Has the Sri Lankan government done anything about the war crimes uh, or uh, brought the perpetrators to book at all? Because we're looking at army the, the officers having meted out the kind of treatment they meted out to Tamil civilians. No, I think the simple answer is that the person they allege was executed, Ishipriya, was not a Tamil civilian. But that's not the point. If she had surrendered legally, then she should not have been executed. That's absolutely correct. Similarly with the people on the white flag case. I think the Secretary of Defense answered that. But I think when you talk of multiple data, I think you need to be precise. Let me tell you what happened in Australia when I went there. I went there early morning. ABC wanted to interview me. Uh, I, I was warned that there were some horrifying pictures. Uh, I said, let me look at them. So I was given them five minutes before. And there were three pictures. And I said, one of them, one of them, they seem to be Sri Lankan army, but they're looking at a dead body. The second is of a boy hanging, but it's an isolated picture of a boy. We hung him, you hung him, you know, the LTT hung him, the UN hung him, we don't know. The third, which is horrifying, is of a man being cut up. That was really quite ghastly. But I looked at the pictures and then I said to the TV, I said, you know, that looked like army uniform, but there were two people there wearing barta slippers, you know, rubber slippers. And those pictures, it's very clear that those are, couldn't be soldiers. Do you know ABC did not produce the pictures after that in its film? They did not broadcast what I said. I asked them for a video of my interview. They refused to give it to me. So, you know, when you say multiple, it's very clever. You show something that's clearly Sri Lankan army, but not doing anything very horrifying. Then you show other pictures of something but is horrifying. But there, is, there, is there evidence with the Sri Lankan government of war crimes? As far as I know, no. I mean, the Secretary of Defense said yesterday on the... As I said, there are two incidents I think should be investigated. I have said so. I've said so in writing, having watched the Channel 4 film. One of them is the white flag case. The Secretary of Defense said yesterday that the Army had no official information. He mentioned himself specifically. I have asked him about this, and he said the same, that there was no negotiation about a surrender that came to his notice. Now, Palita Kahuna, UN ambassador, who says that he sent an email, Says, but this is what I said normally, I wasn't negotiating. Now, maybe those should be questioned further about what precisely was going on. But I think if you look at some of the evidence produced by a man called D.B.S. Jairaj, okay. Tamil, he wrote a long article about this. I think he makes it very clear that uh, anything that happened was not on the instructions of the Defense Secretary. But as I've said, it would be good to investigate that. Our problem really, and you have to recognize this, is that because this started on a campaign to attack the President and the Defense Secretary, we have to be very, very careful. Just as when I say there were civilian casualties, people say, you admit you kill civilians. You have to be careful dealing in the context of Sri Lankan politics and the attacks on us when they're trying to reconcile with the Tamil people that any rushing to conclusions would be a mistake. All I can say is that I spoke and I said to 22 people, none of them had any animosity. A few of them described the way they were welcomed and looked after by the, by the army. 
Now, obviously, 22 people is not a large sample. But there could have been straying elements, Professor uh, Vijay Singha, and those straying elements within the army are still serving. So well, how, what do you do? Would you not accept that, there, uh, that these are war crimes, that the Sri Lankan government is answerable to its own Tamil civilian population? It's not answerable to its Tamil civilian population, it's accountable to its Sri Lankan population. Please get this clear. Yes. Sri Lanka is not about Sinhalese and Tamils, it's about Sri Lankans. And doing the right thing is something we owe all our people. Hmm. And we will try to do it. But you see, what no army does is run around desperately looking for evidence about its own people. However, if it is provided, and we have asked, I mean, I asked Philip Alston for the video, I didn't get it. We asked Channel 4 for the videos, we never got them. What they sent Philip Alston themselves was a doctored version. But as I said, the latest film does seem to me to have two scenes, and if Channel 4 were to supply it to us, we have now invited them to come to Sri Lanka, just as we invited the Tamil MPs who shouted at us, because we feel, believe nothing is better than seeing exactly what happened. So this is a kind of an evidence of war crime, not proven yet, but you'll be it's looking not it. evidence of war crimes. It is a, a, a evidence that suggests that perhaps looking at a couple of incidents would be good. That is what the LLRC is about. It has got a lot of things. Everyone thinks it's about war crimes. It is not about war crimes. It is about reconciliation. It's about lessons learned. It's about building better for the future. One aspect of that is dealing with any war crimes that well, A, because they're crimes, but B, also because they would inhibit reconciliation. But of course, the reason they're now trying to inhibit reconciliation is because they're being played up. And I think it's uh, uh, very important for journalists all over the world to look at the facts and look at the evidence, not say things like there's plenty of videos and plenty of films. There's just a few, some of which are clearly cooked up. Let me give you one final example. In Canada recently, two people who had applied for asylum were ruled, one, to have participated in the execution of Sri Lankan soldiers. I don't know whether you've read it. His defense was he hadn't actually done so, but he admitted that people had come around asking for volunteers, and he himself had also contributed to this. And people with AK-47s, which are the weapons in that scene, had then gone off and executed Sri Lankan soldiers. That's in a Canadian court of law. The second is a man who said he wasn't really a terrorist because he had been part of the LTT's propaganda wing. 